Thank you all very much for being here to tonight for our second public lecture series, which is presented by Health Partners. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Maria McCready's, and I am the theme leader for Healthy Mothers, Babies and Children here at SAMRI, at the Women's and Children's Hospital and uh, Flinders Medical Centre. It's wonderful to see many of you here tonight having uh, a brave uh, a, a coolish evening during the school holidays um, to hear s from our experts in the area of pregnancy and diet, early feeding and, and allergies. So I think it'll be, it's shaping up to be a really interesting and fantastic uh, evening. And before we hear from our presenters, I'd like to introduce uh, Mr Byron Gregory, who's the CEO from Health Partners. Health Partners is our sponsor for this series of public lectures and I'd like to thank them for their continued support. And without them, you wouldn't have been here in this room tonight. So Byron, thank you, and uh, please come and say a few words. Thanks very much, Maria, and good evening, everyone, and welcome to the second lecture of the Health Partners series. We certainly received very positive feedback from our first lecture, and. Uh, we're really looking forward to tonight, and I've got no doubt that it will be very informative and insightful. Just a, a couple of comments. As a company, our Health Partners is certainly very aware of the trust that's placed in us by our members in partnering with them uh, and caring for them throughout their lives. And supporting families, new parents, mothers and babies, toddlers is just one way in which we achieve our key objective of being a health partner for life. As an example, for several years now, we've off offered a newborn support program, uh, supporting our members through early pregnancy through to the time a child turns 12 months old. Our members can access registered midwives throughout this period, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It's a fantastic service and it's highly valued by those who use it. In addition to our newborn support program, this week we're actually launching our collaboration with Good Start Early Learning Centres and this will be another level of support for families and children and a continuation and expansion of our partnership. There's no doubt that early childhood nutrition is the first step in the growth and development of young children and if we as an educated society can get that right then we will hopefully see positive outcomes in the health status of our population in the longer term. Health Partners is owned by its members and we put our members ahead of profits and so for us and for our members in the broader South Australian community this lecture series that we're sponsoring with SAMRI and the panel discussion tonight is giving back to the South Australian community in a, in a tangible way. So it's now my pleasure to welcome the panel and I look forward to an interesting evening. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, uh, Byron. That's fantastic. Um, what we'll do is we'll have each of the, the speakers uh, come up and give their presentation and then we'll have a panel discussion at the end. So we do have a few questions that have come in through Facebook, but as you hear the presentations, please um, uh, make note of your questions and we're looking forward to a vibrant discussion at the end. Our first speaker is Professor Tim Green, um, who is the, uh, the principal nutritionist here at SAMRI, and he joined us at SAMRI uh, earlier this year from the University of British Columbia, um, has had a wealth of experience, uh, 15 years working in the perinatal area um, across a range of different countries, low and middle income countries, as well as uh, obviously highly industrialised countries like uh, Canada and Australia. So we look forward to hearing Tim's talk um, about diet during pregnancy, setting up for an early start to life. Um, thank you, Maria. Um, I've been given 10 minutes to cover nine months, so we get about a minute a month. Um, Pregnancy, diet during pregnancy, probably the most important time to have a proper diet. And it doesn't just start at when you're pregnant. Actually, now we need to start prior to conception. And I'll cover that a little bit as we move along. So what happens during pregnancy? Well, 
we put on women, we, we women put on a, quite a bit of weight. We get about, on total, um, about 11.5 to 15.5 kilograms. Some of this is fluid, some of it is increased fat, some of it is increased blood volume, the placenta weighs a certain amount, the baby actually weighs less than all those combined, and the uterus is up to uh, 1.8 kilograms. So where does all this stuff, all this material come from? Ultimately from the food we eat. So it sounds like it's very complicated, and actually we like to think it is, but really when it comes down to it, really in general with a few exceptions, we really just need to follow Australia's guide to healthy eating. Now there's some debates about this guide now, but general principles are fairly uh, straightforward. One of the things we are facing in Australia and around the world is women entering pregnancy overweight or obese. And of course, we all cite the example of the United States. We like to pick on that because I'm from Canada, you know, where 50 to 60 percent of women are entering pregnancy overweight and obese. And so we've changed our pregnancy recommendations for weight gain based on the weight of the woman during pregnancy. So. Now we say, and you've, I assume you've, most of you have heard of BMI before. Anybody heard of it? Yeah. So we can classify people, women, as underweight, ideal, overweight, and obese. We used to call ideal normal, but that's no longer the normal. It tends to be closed further down towards overweight and obese. But basically, as you can see, that the lower you start weight, or your lower weight you start with, the more weight you gain during pregnancy. So that if you are obese, obese you don't really need gain as much weight. And of course, when this comes to eating, we always think about eating for two, but it's not really eating for two. So what are the problems with uh, consequences of obesity during pregnancy? Well, infertility, and that's kind of a dumb one because if you were pregnant, you wouldn't be infertile. Uh, miscarriage, stillbirth, preeclampsia, which is a major problem, which is hypertension in pregnancy. And when a woman de uh, develops preeclampsia, basically has to go into the hospital for monitoring and uh, maybe eventual cesarean section. Uh, diabetes, uh, labor complications, and uh, often results in a, in a large baby. So how much extra do we need to eat, or do women need to eat during pregnancy? Well, in the first semester, in terms of calories or kilojoules, really nothing, nothing extra. Uh, there's no recommendations for extra. The little fetus is very small then and is not requiring much extra additional uh, kilojoules. But in the second trimester, this goes up to about 1,400 kilojoules. Uh, this is equivalent to two glasses of milk or a banana and a yogurt. And when you get up to the third trimester, it's 1,900 kilojoules. So two milk, piece of bread, two eggs, a yogurt or a banana. So it's really not a, a lot. And for somebody who is obese to start with, this amount will be even less that they need to eat during pregnancy. And the good news that you will hear in, is that during lactation, energy requirements go up even more. So you're allowed to eat more during lactation. I wanted to pose a question, I'm not going to answer it, we can wait for the uh, discussion at the end, but do pregnant women need a supplement? And I picked Elevit because it's all I ever see on the television, so it was the first one I went to to pick up, but I'm not endorsing that one specifically. But clearly Adelaide women and Australian women uh, seem to think that women do need to take a supplement because 93% of women in a survey were taking supplements sometime during pregnancy, usually a multivitamin uh, uh, and mineral. Kind of interesting here, only 50% were taking supplements prior to pregnancy, and I'll come back to why this is important in a minute. A couple of nutrients, what are the nutrients that are, are increased? Well, there's iron, and we know the good sources of iron are animal sources, but we can also get iron from uh, uh, plant sources as well. Uh, in developing countries, we often recommend that women take iron supplements routinely in pregnancy, but in most, uh, high-income countries this isn't necessary and you really just need to monitor for uh, anemia or iron deficiency. Iodine has been a problem recently in Australia uh, because the iodine is low in the, in the diet uh, and there were some concerns about cognitive impairment but iodine has now been added to bread so that it is available there. The two that I thought I would focus in on are vitamin D and folate because there's been a lot of interest in those recently. So vitamin D. Well, low vitamin D during pregnancy has been associated with preeclampsia, an increased rate of gestational diabetes or diabetes during pregnancy, an increased risk of low birth weight, 
And in the offspring, uh, an increased risk of asthma, type 1 diabetes, autism. Problem is that vitamin D has been associated with every other condition under the sun as well. So these are associations. They're not, there isn't a lot of what we call randomized controlled trial evidence. These are basically looking at levels in mums and then relating them to some adverse outcome. So we really need clinical trial evidence for that. Why do we need vitamin D? Well, it's important for calcium absorption and bone health. There are very few dietary sources available. Uh, fortified foods, and it shouldn't say milk because it's not fortified in Australia, but margarine is. Uh, fatty fish, eggs, uh, supplements. Our main source is sunshine, so you would think that really it shouldn't be a big issue in Australia with the land of sunshine. But of course, in the winter months, the sun is not strong enough to make vitamin D. We are getting messages now to cover up and not to expose uh, the skin. And increasingly, the population is becoming uh, less white and more dark-skinned people, and dark-skinned people need more sunshine to make an equivalent amount of vitamin D. So I think we just stay tuned for this one, but I do think it's one that's going to be of interest. We also have, have you heard about folate before? Well, folate, uh, one of the things about folate was it was discovered that folate uh, is the, can reduce the risk of something called a neural tube defect. Now, a neural tube defect, the, two that you've, the one that you've probably heard of is spina bifida, uh, which leads to varying degrees of paralysis, or anencephaly or anencephaly, which where the baby dies at birth because the brain doesn't properly form. And really what a neural tube defect is a failure of the spinal cord to close properly. This closes normally around 28 days post-conception. So after the woman becomes pregnant. And of course, this is before most women know they're actually pregnant. So unless you're planning a pregnancy and taking folic acid, then uh, you won't get the benefits of folic acid. So folic acid taken around the time of pregnancy out to about 28 days can reduce the risk of neural tube defects. After that, it's not particularly important. And curiously, most women start taking supplements after they find out they're pregnant, which is at two or three months. Uh, and here we have good randomized control trial studies. Uh, this is a study done in China, and only in China can you do a study with 250,000 women. I mean, we're excited when we do 5,000 women, but they had 250,000 women. And it, it's a bit of a complicated design, but basically they looked at women who got folic acid and those that it did not, and in northern China they saw an 80% reduction in neural tube defects. So they went from about seven or eight down to about one and a half per 1,000 uh, births. Uh, but in the southern region, they saw, because the rates were much lower to start with, they saw a much smaller reduction. And this is more in line, of, probably a little bit higher than you would see in Australia. So we wouldn't expect as big of a reduction in Australia. So how can we increase folate? Well, we could do it through vegetables but, uh, and foods that are high in folate, but it's a bit difficult. We can do it through supplements. But again, problematic if women are not planning a pregnancy, and 50% of women don't plan their pregnancy. It doesn't mean that the pregnancy is unwanted, it's just unplanned. And the other strategy that has been employed elsewhere until recently is to add folic acid or folate to a food staple such as bread. And this has caused all kinds of issues over the last 15 or 20 years about whether we should be adding folic acid or folate to bread. I show you Canada for uh, one reason. It was one of the first countries to adopt fortification. We like to think it was because it was for the health of the people, but the Americans threatened that they wouldn't take our wheat anymore unless we've made it like theirs and added folic acid to it. So it was, like most things, an economic decision, not a health decision. But what I wanted to show you here is this is before fortification, and I point to Newfoundland way out there on the east coast with a rate of around four and a half. That's very high. And you look at British Columbia on the other side with about one. So you're going to expect a much bigger decline with fortification in, out in the east than you are in the west. And this is exactly what you've got. You've got a it dropped almost 80% in, in Newfoundland, whereas you've got a much smaller drop in British Columbia. So this is British Columbia gives you a sort of a sense of what you might expect in Australia. Now, the decision was made in, I believe, 2009 to fortify bread in Australia. It was meant to be done with New Zealand, but New Zealand bailed out at the last minute and didn't participate. But you can see as we go along, we're looking at levels in the blood in the population, and you can see where that arrow comes down. That is when they started adding folic acid to bread, and you can see that there is a sharp 
rise in the blood folate levels. Now, the only problem is it's not just the mothers who, are, who could become pregnant, but the whole population has been exposed to uh, folic acid, but that's a debate that goes beyond the scope of this. So what has happened in Australia? Well, it's kind of what we predicted. There has been a 14% reduction in uh, neural tube defects in the total population. Among indigenous uh, women, the rates have dropped by 74%. And among teenagers, who you've got to be thinking aren't planning on getting pregnant, so therefore you would expect a bigger fall in them, you get about a 50% reduction. Okay, so I thought I'd just finish with this one slide. And what is this slide is suggesting is, is it's something called the Barker hypothesis, and it was first thought of, thought about during the Dutch famine. Now, during the Dutch famine, the, the rations, because of the Germans and all that, the rations dropped to about six or 700 calories for a period of time. And the babe, mothers who were pregnant during that period, their offspring, when they became 40 and 50, were more increased risk of having cardiovascular disease. So what this is suggesting is that mother's nutrition during pregnancy can have effects on, lifelong effects on the health of the child. And that's, we won't go into the details of that. And worryingly, I just saw that the men's sperm condition can also have an effect on the quality of the child later on in life, so we are in trouble. So anyway, that's the end of the talk, and thank you. Thanks very much, Tim. I think you've uh, raised a few good points for, for the discussion. Um, before we move on to the next presentation, I'd just like to um, introduce Beth and Joe, who are, uh, stand up and wave your, your hands. Um, so Beth and Joe will be manning the table at the back. Um, and uh, we're actually running a study at the moment about omega-3 fatty acids and reducing the risk of uh, early preterm birth, less than 34 weeks. So if you're interested in any, uh, getting some information about that study, please uh, see Beth and Joe. We're aiming to recruit 5,500 women. We've recruited about 3,800, so we're well on the way. Um, and if you have any interest or know of people who might be interested, please um, see Beth and Joe. Now we're actually moving on to talking about the benefits of breastfeeding and uh, uh, for both the mother and the baby. And our presenter here is uh, Dr. Jackie Miller, who's a senior paediatric dietitian and is a senior lecturer at Flinders University and has a wealth of experience in the area of breastfeeding. Please welcome Jackie. Thanks, Maria. Um, I'm glad to see some mums and some mums to be in the audience because this uh, talk is primarily for them. And before I start, I just want to say this about breastfeeding. Breastfeeding is so much more than just providing milk to your baby. Breastfeeding is about nurturing. It's about bonding with your baby. It's about love. So because of that, it's usually tied up with a lot of emotion. So if breastfeeding is going really well, that's great. If breastfeeding for some reason isn't living up to your expectations, it can be absolutely laden with guilt. And really, I don't think there's a place for guilt in mothering. Crikey, we're all doing the best we can. So I don't want this talk, I would really like this talk to just inspire you about breastfeeding so that if you do come across some difficult times, you can persevere or seek help. So what I've chosen to do is in my 10 minutes tell you 10 amazing facts about breastfeeding and I'm going to have to talk very fast to get through them. The first one is breast milk is the best nutrition. Do you know that the first six months of a baby's life, if you think about it, it is the only time in the entire life cycle of a human being where we are dependent on one single food source for our nutrition. And that happens to coincide with the time of the most rapid growth of the baby. It's not only growth in terms of, of their body, but also their brain. So we've got one opportunity to get this right. And breast milk fits that perfectly. It provides a perfect balance of nutrients for the baby. It's in an easily digested form and it's low protein, so it's, it suits immature um, kidneys. 
So what can you do about this? The guidelines say that we should exclusively breastfeed, that means not giving the baby any other food or fluids, for around six months, and then continue breastfeeding with solid foods introduced after this. If you eat a healthy diet, um, it will improve some of the vitamin and mineral content of your breast milk. But even if you don't, your breast milk is still going to be quite good. The body's quite good at gathering up nutrients and concentrating them in breast milk. So it will still be better than formula. The second amazing fact is that breast milk changes. It adapts um, and it changes to meet the needs of the baby. So it's not the same right throughout lactation. It changes from the beginning to the end of a feed and it changes over time from the beginning of lactation to when we wean at the end of lactation. So many of you will know about colostrum, the first milk, the thick yellow fluid that comes in. It's very high in protein and immune factors, but very low in volume at a time when the baby doesn't need a lot of volume, but does need a lot of protection. Then it transitions to mature milk. And then over time, as we come to wean our babies, it starts to reduce in volume, but it concentrates the amount of immune factor in the breast milk so that the baby, regardless of what stage it's at, is getting quite a good dose of immune factors. And over the course of a single feed, the fat content, we know that the fat content changes. So it's lower when the breast is fullest, usually at the beginning of a feed, and higher fat content at the end of the feed. My third amazing fact is that breastfed babies have a higher IQ. Um, IQ increases for every month of additional breastfeeding that you manage to do. Now, this is a complex issue to tease out, but the statistics show that for those who were breastfed for one month compared to those who were never breastfed, there was a small four IQ point difference um, in their IQ, and that increases for every month. The effect is even greater for preterm babies where it, where it doubles. So what, what's causing this? It's possibly due to uh, one of the special fats that's in milk called docosahexaenoic acid, or we like to say DHA because it's much easier. Um, DHA you might know because it's one of the components of fish oil, so you hear a lot about fish oil. Um, it's incorporated into brain tissue, the central nervous system and the eyes, and breast milk has a good source of DHA in it. It's also got a very high level of lactose, and lactose is made up of glucose and galactose, and galactose is also one of the components in brain tissue. So there might be lots of different issues working here. Um, also, we can't rule out that it might be related to the fact that it's quite, um, that breastfed babies sometimes get more stimulation um, than babies fed formula. Breast milk's easier to digest, to digest, so therefore they need to feed more often. That's, um, that's not a problem, it's a good thing. Um, and because they need to feed more often, they're handled more and there's more stimulation. So what can you do about this? Well, if you eat some oily fish like salmon, that's a good thing for anybody to do, regardless of whether you're breastfeeding or not, then that will provide you with the DHA, the omega-3 fats that you need. Um, but watch out for really high mercury fish like shark and um, orange roughy. Um, there's no need to take fish oil supplements. People think a little bit of fish is good. I'll have a super brainy child and have lots of fish oil, but it actually um, doesn't, doesn't have any effect. So you might as well save your money and not waste it on supplements. And of course, interacting with your baby um, is always a good thing to do. My fourth fact is um, the immune factors in breast milk and how it protects against an infection. And I've just got some statistics here for you to have a look at. So if babies are not breastfed, they have twice the risk of developing ear infections than others, um, 2.8 times the risk of diarrhoea and vomiting, and 3.6 times the risk of hospitalisation in the first year of life for respiratory illness. Now, these figures are not third world countries where they don't have a clean water supply. They're um, developed countries like Australia. Now, they're pretty impressive. If we actually had a drug that worked that well, we'd be pretty pleased about that. And yet here it is provided just in breast milk. I then want to talk about just a couple of what I think are the amazing protective factors in breast milk. There's lots at play, but I'm only going to talk about a couple of them. And the first one is secretory IgA. It's the most abundant antibody in milk, and it has a very um, interesting mechanism. I'll just explain this diagram because it is a little um, confusing. So this here is the mum. Doesn't look like a mum, but that's what it is. Um, 
If the mother is exposed to germs, either um, inhaling through her mouth and nose or ingesting into her stomach, into her gastrointestinal tract, what, what will happen is she will produce antibodies that are specific to those germs that she's been exposed to. Those antibodies then travel through her body to the mammary gland and are secreted in the milk. So um, virtually at the same time as you're being exposed to um, germs, the baby is being delivered the antibodies and protection against those. So it's a pretty knacky little system. Um, what you can do to help this, well, you don't need to do anything if you're with your baby all the time. If you're not with your baby, so for example in childcare, then it's really important to have skin-to-skin -skin contact when you are back, in, um, back together again. And who doesn't want to kiss and cuddle their, body, their baby after you've been away for a while? And what that will do is it will expose you to the germs that the baby's been exposed to and then you will start to make antibodies to that. The other really amazing protective factor in, in breast milk is called the Bifidus factor. Now this is a little bit like probiotics, you'd all, you'd all know about probiotics I guess. Um, so there's a bacteria that grows in baby's bowel called the Bifidus bacteria. Now that's a good guy and we want lots of them because if you've got lots of them they crowd out all the bad bugs and Bifidus factor uh, the Bifidus bacteria like to eat this group of oligosaccharides called the Bifidus factor. So basically what it's doing is it's providing the, the good bugs with food. So they flourish in the gastrointestinal system of the baby and crowd out the bad bacteria. So what you can do to help this, well this system works best with exclusive breastfeeding. Um, so if possible, it's good to avoid comp feeding um, in hospital when the baby's born and top up feeds at home if you possibly can. I find the sort of vulnerable times for wanting to, to um, give your baby a comp feed is in the first um, few weeks after you've gone home from hospital when you're still all just learning what to do. Um, and then often at about three months or when the baby has a growth spurt because they're suddenly demanding a lot more and mums will suddenly start to think, oh, I'm not producing enough milk for them. Um, so watch out for those times. Having said that, any breast milk is better than none and it's not a disaster if your baby gets a bottle of formula here and there along the way. So don't lose sleep over that. All right, this, uh, this one, I'm on to number seven now. I find this one really fascinating. There's something in breast milk that protects not just at the time you're giving that baby that breast milk, but long into the future. So, um, so breastfeeding seems to set up the baby such that it protects against diseases that you wouldn't normally see until early childhood. So these include type one diabetes, celiac disease, inflammatory bowel disease, allergies, leukemia. Um, and obesity. So certainly worth doing because it has long-term benefits for your baby. So what you can do to help this, um, keep breastfeeding while you introduce solids. There's certainly um, some evidence to suggest, particularly with celiac disease, that um, if you're continuing to breastfeed over that time, that has some kind of protective effect. And it seems that with some of those diseases, every month of breastfeeding confers a benefit. So every extra bit that you can do really helps. All right, on to number eight, and I think I better turn to the mums now because there are some benefits for them. And again, there are some short-term and long-term benefits. So the short-term benefits are that every time you put the baby to the breast, you will have some hormones that are released to stimulate the uterus to contract back to normal. This helps with weight loss after birth, and it also delays the return of ov ovulation. So you not only get time to replenish your iron stores, but reduce the risk of pregnancy. So follow infant fed leading, feed whenever the baby wants to feed and eating a healthy diet will certainly help with weight loss. Long term benefits to the mum, there's a reduced risk of breast and ovarian cancer and also a reduced risk of type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease. My final benefit is to the world basically, the economical and the environmental ecological side of, of um, breastfeeding. Breast milk is cheap, it's um, estimated to be worth $2.2 billion a year in Australia. Um, there's no packaging, no um, transport, no it's produced without contamination, it's got a very low industrial footprint, so it's good for, um, it's good for the environment. So just to summarise, breast is best, not just for the baby and the mum, but also for the world. Thank you.
Thanks very much, Jackie. Um, it's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Mera Nessing, um, who is a senior allergy dietitian and um, works at the clinical research interface and is becoming quite an expert in translating the research that we do um, into practice and practice guidelines. So please welcome Meryn. So I still work as a clinical dietitian as well as um, working um, in research. So a lot of what I'm going to talk about will be uh, fairly practical, I hope. Um, just I'm going to talk about food allergies, about early feeding in allergy development and talk about our updated infant feeding guidelines, which um, are very new. I'm not going to be talking about um, reactions to lactose or fructose because these are not allergies, they're carbohydrate malabsorption. And I'm also not going to be talking about reactions to natural or added food chemicals because they're not allergies. These are um, food chemical intolerances. But uh, just so that you know what we're talking about. Um, an allergy is actually a reaction to a protein or a part of a protein in a food and this is caused by immune antibodies or immune cells. And that's about all the immunology you're going to get. Um, now, allergies can cause immediate reactions or delayed reactions, so reactions delayed by an hour or even a day later in the case of eczema, for example. All gut allergies are sometimes delayed. Now, allergies can be to any food protein, but there are eight common food allergies. Um, the most common ones in Australia are things like to um, cow's milk, um, to egg or fish or shellfish, uh, peanut, tree nut allergy, wheat allergy and soy. Uh, but you can, you know, we see allergies to all sorts of different foods. Now, allergies in Australia are actually really common. In fact, we've got one of the highest rates of food allergies in young children in the world. And uh, there was a study in Melbourne called the Health Nuts Study. And in this group of children that they looked at, at one year of age, who'd just rocked up to immunisation clinic, they found that one in 10 had a proven food allergy. So when they, they brought them in, they gave them the food that they thought they were allerg allergic to and they had reactions. So a proven food allergy. And uh, this is actually a big change. Um, so when I was at school, myself, food allergies were really rare um, in my classmates, although we, I had classmates who had hay fever and asthma. But nowadays, when kids are at school, food allergies are really common. And uh, you might find in a, in a classroom setting that you know, there might be three you know, siblings, three children who've had allergies or um, still have their allergies. And what, what we're actually finding is that there are more children that may have had their allergies as babies that are carrying their food allergy with them into primary school and even on into high school and onto universities. So it seems to be that the allergies are more common, but there is a group of children who are having their allergies for longer. We don't really know why people develop food allergies. If we did, you know, we'd be able to do something really good about um, stopping it happening and that's one of the big area of research at the moment. Um, allergy develops um, in a really complex interaction between your genetic um, predisposition um, and uh, the environment and your allergen exposure and your immune system. So, um, so it's very complex and we know that one of the environmental factors that uh, does play a role is your diet and that's what I'm going to be focusing on, um, particularly the diet in early childhood. <coughs> so um, just recognising that, um, we've had feeding guidelines for allergy prevention which have been produced by ASCIA um, since about 19, oh, 1998. So ASCIA is the Australasian Society for Clinical Immuno Immunology and Allergy. It's the main body that um, the allergists and the immunologists um, belong to. And um, ASCIA is a part of an international network of allergy specialty organisations. And uh, one of the roles for ASCIA is actually to put out infant feeding and allergy prevention guidelines. 
and these are complementary to the National Health and Medical Research Council infant feeding guidelines which are for all healthcare professionals, um, for all children. Okay, so the guidelines are based on scientific evidence and the evidence may be derived from large population based studies that uh, like Tim was talking about that look at trends so you might get you might look at a certain incidence of a food in a mother's diet and you know, less or more food allergy. And also results from randomised controlled trials, which is very high level um, and important um, information for us to have, where you might take a group of people who are all at the same starting point, divide them into two different groups and compare you know, one group getting one intervention with the group that gets no intervention at all. So as, um, what, as we've learned more about allergy development from these studies, um, our focus in the guidelines has changed um, really from delaying giving the babies common allergens in their diet to actually actively including common food allergens in babies' diets, which sounds a bit counterintuitive, doesn't it, that um, you know, actually giving the food might actually prevent an allergy developing, but the most recent research is actually showing that that's the case. So there are two studies I'm going to talk about um, that are important. Um, first one was called the LEAP study, which LEAP stands for Learning Early About Peanut. And it was a big study in the UK and it had a lot of press. You probably heard about it in the media last year. Um, they enrolled um, just over 600 babies who had eczema and some of them also had an egg allergy. <coughs> And um, from about seven um, months of age, um, they divided them into two groups. One group were given peanut, about six grams of peanut protein a week, and the other group were asked to avoid peanut. Now, they did this for five years, which is a long time for a study. And then when the children were all five years of age, they brought them into clinic, and uh, they actually gave them a peanut challenge. So they gave them some peanut to eat, starting with really small amounts and grading up and they actually found that the group eating peanut were five times less likely to have a peanut allergy at five years of age compared to those children who were totally avoiding peanut. So that's really changed the way that we're, um, that our guidelines have headed, or we, we thought our guidelines were going to head this way, but it's given us really good solid information that it's the right thing to be doing. The other study I'm going to talk about is actually an Adelaide study and uh, some of you who have children may have been involved in the study called the STEP study, which the STEP trial. So the STEP trial was um, an egg-based study and it was a randomised controlled trial, so one of those very high level um, quality studies again and uh, in Adelaide they um, in enrolled 820 babies with a family history of allergies who didn't have eczema and they compared egg in the dark versus total egg avoidance from four to six months of age. And uh, all the children were given um, egg again at eight months of age when we'd normally be introducing egg. And they tested the incidence of egg allergy at one year of age. Now this study um, didn't find a difference between um, the two groups. Although, if you look here, this is the group that was egg-free compared with the group that had no egg, but there's no difference um, when we do the statistics. But remember, this study was only done, you know, they tested allergy at one year of age, so it wasn't a very long avoidance of egg. It was more along the guidelines that we, we'd be telling people. And uh, so there was no difference in the amount of allergy, but also um, children um, didn't get more allergy if they avoid it. Okay, so there's two important study. So one of the things I've been involved with, with this year is actually looking at the way we um, talk to parents about infant feeding and allergy guidelines because what we've found is that if you look on websites for different um, hospitals and uh, different feeding information that everything's just slightly different. So I've been working with the Centre of Food and Allergy Research in Melbourne to actually get us all saying exactly the same thing, which is um, much better for parents. So I'm going to talk to you just quickly about the new um, infant feeding guideline wording, the harmonised wording. 
So first is that exclusive breastfeeding is recommended for the first four months of age or until complementary feeding is commenced, so start when you start solid foods, with continued breastfeeding up to two years or as long as the mother and child desire. And uh, if you're not breastfeeding, then you don't need to buy a special formula um, and that's a change. So just an ordinary standard infant formula, not a, part not a partially hydrolyzed formula. And when your infant's ready, at around six months of age, but not before four months of age, start to introduce a variety of solid foods, starting with iron-rich foods first, while continuing breastfeeding. And I've just listed some of the iron-rich foods there. And uh, signs that your baby may be start ready to start eating solid foods include when the baby's got good head and neck control and can sit upright, when they're starting to show an interest in what people around them is eating, and they might actually try to take food off their off your plate, uh, when they reach out for the food and when they're opening their mouth when you're eating. They're pretty good signs. Now these actually happen at different times for different babies and that's why we say start solid foods at around six months of age. And we really like people to exclusively breastfeed until that time. And then this is the important thing, all infants um, should be given allergenic solid foods including peanut butter, cooked egg and dairy foods and wheat products in the first year of life. That includes infants at high risk of allergy. And this is important because these are really nutritious foods and we shouldn't be scared of feeding them to our babies. So, and we actually um, think that feeding our babies earlier with them, in that first, in that second six months of age, we think will actually um, help reduce the allergy risk. And uh, hopefully it will also um, help parents um, be a little bit less worried about feeding um, things like peanut butter to their children. And we know in Adelaide that we have a thing called a peanut butter party where parents might like to come and do a picnic outside the children's hospital and, you know, in case the, the child has an allergy. And, you know, we know that this is where one of the allergists has his office, so, you know. <laughs> so hopefully our nice clear guidelines will give parents um, the confidence to introduce those allergens to their, their children. And that's all I was going to say, so we'll be able to talk a bit more at question time. Thanks very much, Merrin. I'll just invite Jackie and Tim to come up um, for the panel, and we've um, got about half an hour for questions, so um, questions from the audience. Any questions? Yes, please. For the first speaker, I just wanted to ask, is there any difference between folate and folic acid? What's the best way to explain that to a lay person? Uh, that's, a, <clears throat> sorry, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, there is a difference. Um, folate is, is the naturally occurring type of the vitamin. And there are probably 100 to 200 different forms of folate. One type is folic acid. It is not found in nature. It's a th synthetic compound. It sounds awful because it's got the word acid behind it, so it has a horrible connotation. Uh, but it's the form that we put in supplements or add to foods because it's more stable and it's absorbed more readily than folate. Um, there have been some concerns posed over the last 15 years with this debate around whether we should add folic acid, whether folic acid might be potentially harmful. Uh, and a lot of people have been searching for that. At present, there hasn't been anything that has turned up, but one has to realize that it would only take a little bit of a risk in some sort of disease like cancer or something like that, a common a colon cancer, to certainly change that benefit from uh, you know, being potentially uh, good for the population to being more negative for the population. Other questions? Yes, please. I was, can that hear me? I was just wondering what the recommendation is if you ha uh, have a baby that's lactose intolerant for in terms of breastfeeding. Um, okay, so lactose is quite an important component of breast milk and there will be a lot of babies, particularly young babies, who don't um, cope particularly well with that amount of lactose and have um, 
those of you who are mums will know what I'm talking about, um, large frothy bowel actions that you can hear when you're around the block and you know just kind of cover everything that you've got the baby wrapped in. <laughs> that, <laughs> So uh, there's people that identify with that, yeah. It do that doesn't necessarily mean lactose intolerance. So I think the first thing is to really um, um, work out what's going on with lactose intolerance in your infant because, uh, you know, a degree of, of, of um, you know, frothy poos, etc., is quite normal. Um, Sometimes infants will develop a short-term lactose intolerance, particularly after a gastro illness, and usually that kind of settles a little bit. Sometimes it can settle um, if you make sure that the baby gets plenty of the, the fat-rich hind milk that comes at the end of the feed because that slows down the absorption through, through the gut. And if it's, if it's not settling and it's worrying, then I think you need to seek some medical advice. Does that answer your question? I also have a question about um, breastfeeding. Um, you mentioned about how um, the uh, breastfeeding can change over the course of lactation and also during the feed. Um, if there are two children very close together, say um, just 11 months apart, um, how does that work for if you're if breastfeeding both? Fascinating question. Um, so it, it, it works by favouring the newborn actually. So um, even if you've got an older child and you've fed all through the pregnancy, which um, some others do, um, some mothers find their milk dries up a bit and by then the baby's getting a bit older so they're, they're pro probably maybe getting a few comfort sucks rather than a huge volume of breast milk. Um, the hormonal changes that happen during birth actually stimulate the milk to revert back to kind of what we would expect for newborn. Um, so they will suit the, the new baby. Oh, Hi, I'm, and, um, um, I'm gluten intolerant myself, but my wife isn't, and she's breastfeeding at the moment. Does that gene go on when he's a bit older? Does he get off me, or does he keep it off my wife? I don't know, I'm a bit lost <laughs> Do with you that. you want to have a go at that, Mary? That's a really, um, that's a good question. And uh, I mean, celiac disease is, is a genetic condition. Um, we, we would just um, encourage you just to feed your baby normally. And uh, so breastfeed and introduce solids around the normal time. Yeah, and there's, uh, I wouldn't, um, I don't think there's any evidence to avoid gluten in the baby's diet at all. Yeah, there's actually been some really good studies, uh, two huge studies, one from the US and one from uh, Europe quite recently uh, addressing that very question and um, they're basically saying don't worry about um, you know limiting uh, wheat uh, to the to the baby just feed them normally so another question back here yeah that actually just sparked another question I had um, as well about celiac disease you mentioned about breastfeeding um, later on well, further into um, a baby's life that it can reduce the chance of things like celiac disease. What happens if the mother has celiac disease? Are the guidelines actually just say, to, they, the guidelines just encourage you know, breastfeeding entirely and um, again, um, as Marie was saying, introduce wheat um, at the normal, normal time. Yeah, so it's one of those genetic things that we can't control with the environment and what we're actually learning is that what we eat won't change what will happen. It might happen because of the genetic predisposition but we can't change it with what we eat. Any other questions? Thank you very much to the three of you, it was very interesting. With breastfeeding, there's some very premature research with our society using antibacterials and chemicals with hand washing being absorbed in our fatty tissue. Most of us have fatty tissue in our breasts. These chemicals are sitting in our breast tissue and we're breastfeeding our children. Are they being excreted in breast milk? Um, are you talking about dioxins or are you talking about other chemicals? Are you talking about in your 
back toll and your hand washing, that all these gels that we use mm -hmm. and the antibacterials that are in new cars, new sofas, pillows, dunas. Okay, I'm, I'm, so one of the other panel might be a bit more up to date with this than me. I'm not, I'm not absolutely aware of that, um, so I can't comment about that so much. I know that it is um, a similar, it sounds like a similar situation to the situation with dioxins which were found um, to be expressed in, in some milk in very, very small quantities. So dioxins are a pollutant in the environment and um, um, and it was very worrying for mothers for that to happen. However, I think the important thing was that for, for the large majority of people, they were in very, very, very small doses. And um, the, the, um, to switch to formula doesn't necessarily mean that your baby's still not going to get them. In fact, if you're using formula, you're contributing to the dioxin load in the environment. So um, again, the advice was, was generally um, just to keep on breastfeeding unless there was something, some other medical um, reason not to. Um, does anybody, is anybody else more aware of the yeah. chemicals? That, that's my understanding of, around the phthalate yeah. issue, which I think might be what, what you're referring to in terms of the plasticizers. Yeah. yeah. There's a question at the front. Thank you. Um, a two-pronged question. You talked about um, uh, uh, children growing out of allergies and I'm, I'm interested to understand um, uh, what percentage of children do we expect will grow out of their allergies so that's the first part I have I have three children two of them do have allergies um, the second part was um, one of my sons for example I think has an allergy or an intolerance to legumes I think it must be an allergy because he gets a scratchy throat um, am I best to keep getting going to an allergist every couple of years or should I be testing him out and giving him legumes like chickpeas and see what happens? Okay. All right. So, so that's on. It's still working. It doesn't seem like this. Okay. So the first question you had was about um, developing tolerance as uh, children um, get older. So. Um, most children develop tolerance, which means that they can start to eat the food that they were once allergic to um, as they get older. It really depends on the allergen. So, uh, for example, with peanut um, allergy, we used to think that um, people didn't outgrow their peanut allergy, but we now know that around 95% um, keep their allergy and 5% outgrow. And uh, that's one of the reasons why um, when you see an allergist that every, every year they do your skin prick testing and on the basis of the skin prick test they can work out whether to, the child needs to come into the hospital for a medically supervised food challenge and to see if you've outgrown. Things like egg allergy, um, Oh, um, what was the figure I showed you? It was about 12% um, of kids still had their egg allergy in primary school. And uh, there, there, there's actually some charts that actually show that a lot of, you know, some teenagers, you know, maybe 4% um, to 5% will still have their allergy when they're in their early 20s. Uh, so um, a lot of people with egg allergy will tolerate baked egg before they start to tolerate um, cooked egg. Uh, so that makes the diet a lot easier. And you know, people with wheat allergy outgrow, um, often outgrow their allergy earlier as well, but we don't quite have the figures um, uh, describing that as well as um, for peanut and for egg. Your second question was about your child who with the legume allergy. And uh, you really need to take your allergist's advice about whether to include the legumes in the, your child's diet or not because they're the expert and they know all the clinical details of your child. And, and just to avoid any further confusion, when Merrin talks about wheat allergy, that's different to celiac disease. Um, that's actually quite a different disease and I just thought that that was yeah, worth pointing that's a good out. Point. Yeah. Um, any other questions? Well, one of the questions that came through um, from our Facebook page um, related to 
uh, elimination diets for breastfeeding women. So if a baby has allergies and you're breastfeeding, um, do should you how much food protein might come through the breast milk and would you actually look at an elimination diet for the lactating mother? So that leads back to some very nice Adelaide research um, that Maria was involved in um, that actually measured um, one of my colleagues, Debbie Palmer, um, um, actually measured um, the amount of egg protein in uh, breastfeeding mother's milk and uh, she actually uh, looked at a group of um, babies who had eczema and uh, who actually had the egg antibodies and uh, showed that um, taking the egg out of the mother's diet actually improved the eczema scores in the baby and uh, the eczema sc scores got worse when the egg was put back in. So that's often something, a treatment strategies that allergists will talk about with mothers um, for things like cow's milk or for egg or for nut. Um, for sometimes with children with, ter with babies with very bad eczema. With mild eczema, we often leave the um, allergens in the diet now um, because we think that actually might be, be helpful in learning about tolerisation to the protein. Um, now, the second part of the question was... Uh, does the food protein pass yeah, into yeah. the breast milk That's for right. all the women? Yeah. Oh, the other thing I was going to talk about was um, babies Sometimes we see babies who um, get blood or mucus in their stools and uh, we treat that by um, taking cow's milk and soy out of the mother's diet, very common that is, and that usually gets better within the first year of life. So manipulating the mother's diet is, is something that we do do, but it comes at a big cost. So if you're looking at taking things like milk and egg and soy and wheat and nuts, out of the diet, it means that um, you have to be very careful about your diet when you're breastfeeding and you do need to see a dietitian for some help with that. So obviously what you're talking about, Merrin, is a treatment strategy where you've got a child that already has a well-established allergy. Um, what about women who are thinking about preventing allergies? What about their diets? Okay. The best thing you can do to prevent um, allergies is actually to eat a very well balanced diet. So you, you don't recommend excluding no. um, if the baby has no symptoms? That's exactly right and uh, that's something that's changed so in the last 20 years so 20 years ago we may have actually encouraged mothers you know with a family history of allergy to go on an elimination diet. Uh, the studies that looked at that found that the babies were more likely to have lower birth weight babies and uh, made no difference to the allergy rates. So that's the reason for our, our feeding guidelines. Other questions? Yes? Is there a reason why our allergy issues rates are so high? I mean, have you been hearing something like that or why people That's a really good question. Um, so the question was about why, why does Australia have such a high allergy rate? So um, there are probably a few reasons for that, but um, one, of the, um, one of the possible reasons is that the Health Nut cohort in Melbourne, so the group of people, children that were looked at, um, there were quite a lot of um, people that had moved to Australia from uh, other countries and had their babies, and um, there's a bit of a migration effect. And uh, so they actually found that those, you know, they had quite high. So we're actually repeating the study in um, part, the part, part of um, the coast around Geelong and just to see if um, you know, that part of Victoria has as high rates as, as the Melbourne group that was reported. Do you think there's a evidence of any uh, more common diagnosis now, um, perhaps diagnosing quite mild cases that we perhaps might not have worried about in the past? That's a possibility and in the in the health nut study they actually had uh, they tested for raw egg allergy and um, so they actually found that nine percent of the one-year-olds had raw egg allergies um, whereas you know perhaps what would have happened at home was that the baby might have got a bit of a rash and it might have been ignored so that might be the other reason. But um, the other part of that, Maria, is that we do know clinically that we're seeing children with coming to our clinics with different kinds of allergies. 
So compared with 10 years ago, we're seeing a lot more babies who have um, gut-based allergies um, that don't um, show up on antibody testing. So we're seeing things like um, you know, violent vomiting reactions um, and um, a, a few children that seem to have allergies to lots of different food proteins. So we're seeing, as well as the skin and mm. swelling allergies, we're seeing a lot more gut allergies than we used to see. Other questions? Yes. So when your immune system sees goat's milk, they see the same protein as cow's milk. So to your immune system, it's the same. So it, it doesn't help. And uh, a few years ago, people used to use soy milk for the same reason, and uh, that didn't change the incidence of food allergies as well. So yeah, best thing is to breastfeed if you can. Mm. Yeah. Was there another question over here? No? Other questions? One of the other questions that came through um, the Facebook page also relates to allergies, sorry Maren, um, which was about the uh, growing concern of, about allergies and um, people adopting really strict dietary practices um, and whether things are actually properly medically diagnosed or self-diagnosed. Um, and I guess it comes back to the question about the rising, apparent rising rates of, of egg allergy um, and perhaps some advice about um, what people should do about proper diagnosis uh, compared to self-diagnosis, I guess. All right, so the first part of that is about um, you're limiting your diet because you might be scared of um, developing a food allergy. One of the projects I did as part of my PhD was actually to do a big study where we actually looked at all of, this, all of the um, research articles that had um, looked at the types of diets that mothers were eating while they were pregnant or while they were breastfeeding and then the incidence of allergy, not only food allergy but asthma and eczema in their children. And uh, we found that the um, the trends were really um, less allergy in women that had really well-balanced diets, including lots of fruits and vegetables. And uh, there was also a trend um, towards the Mediterranean diet, which may have been that they were eating lots of fish and lots of monounsaturated oils. So no evidence at all to, to have a very restrictive diet for fear of allergies. In fact, it's better to have a more diverse diet. The other part of the question was about um, you know, does my baby have an allergy, um, so a skin allergy or a gut allergy? And the best person to talk to about that is your GP or your paediatrician. Don't um, go down the track of um, taking things out of your diet first because that can end up um, in very hard places where, you know, if you're breastfeeding, you end up on a very restricted diet, maybe for no benefit in your child at all. And there's always the you know, the what if, what if I take out this and what if I take out that, and uh, may not have been the case at all. So make sure you get a good diagnosis. And in Adelaide, we're very blessed with lots of good allergists, way more than in a lot of the other cities. <laughs> they don't have enough work. <laughs> any, any last questions? Yes, so to uh, Karen and then down the front. Um, this question's for Tim. I'm just wondering how um, we can inform parents how to balance sun exposure to increase vitamin D naturally for their children with the, um, you know, the skin cancer and safety in the sun. Um, like, is there a way that there can be a public message to ensure that they can still get the natural vitamin D? Uh, great question. Um, it's very difficult to know what a safe level of sun exposure is because in trying to decide whether I should put my baby out, and of course there probably is a safe level of sun exposure, first I'd have to decide, well, how dark is my baby? What time of year is it? What is the cloud cover? Am I in Adelaide or in uh, Darwin? It's not a simple public health message to communicate like lose weight or quit smoking, you know. Um, so I think that's probably a very difficult one, and again, 
we don't, and there's always this tendency to say, well, the little's good, why not leave the child out uh, a little bit longer in the sun? Now, one of the big sort of conundrums we've had with breastfeeding is that we, we say that the breast provides, breast milk provides everything that the baby needs, but it doesn't actually provide vitamin D. And originally, babies were never meant to get vitamin D from breast milk. They were meant to get it from sunlight exposure. So in a lot of countries at a similar latitude, and of course, the further you're away from the equator, the more of a seasonal effect you get in vitamin D, it's actually recommended that the baby be supplemented, breastfed babies be supplemented with vitamin D. Now, this causes problems because, you know, the breast, breast is best message, and of course, formula has vitamin D added to it. So we are trying to do some research to see whether we can supplement the mother to a certain level to increase the vitamin D in her breast milk, which would be a better way than trying to sort of make that breast as best message and confuse it. But thanks for the question. So the last question down the front here. What is being done to address maternal obesity during pregnancy? Since it's extreme risk, not only to the mother, but to the future of the baby. Well, I mean, I guess the, the question is really, it's not just pregnancy. I mean, it's, it's, it's the whole population. The child, the child, you know, just something. Mm -hmm. Well, then I think that is why we have now created recommendations that are based on the mother's weight. So really, uh, a mother mm -hmm. that is obese to start with actually will, you know, is recommended not to gain anywhere near as much weight as she would have been 15 or 20 years ago. Um, it's an intractable problem. I mean, people have been trying to study obesity and the rates just keep rising and rising. I would say it mentioned that lactation is a mm -hmm. great way to lose weight because that is one period when you actually use up a lot of calories. So you can actually eat quite a bit more. And actually, the, the sort of the older the child gets to a point, the more breast milk they're consuming and the more calories that are being used. So encouraging breastfeeding, I guess, would be one way to... That's too late for the baby. It's too late for the baby, but the best way to do would be to enter pregnancy at a healthy weight. But we know that's not going to happen, so, you know, what do we do? If we can solve that, sorry. Yeah. I think we're actually getting that information to the public and I think people understanding it a bit better. Hope, yeah. I mean I think I think you make the point I think you make a good point that, you know, this is a period, and if pregnancy is planned, mm. like you planned your pregnancy, it is an opportunity, and it is a time when people do make those kind of changes in their lifestyle. So it's an opportunity that then, of course, a lot of pregnancies are unplanned, and we have the, the same sort of issue, but, but thanks, Dorothy. Yeah, no, there is a lot of active work, and different things work for different people, and it is one of those things about, you know, uh, do you have specific... Uh, food serves, do you have specific weight goals and different things will work for different people and there is a lot of work going on in that area but as Tim is saying it is a really difficult issue because you know technically we have about 50% of women entering their pregnancy technically overweight so it, it is a big issue yeah so thank you very much, everybody. Thank you for your stamina. Thank you for your questions and coming. And most importantly, a special thanks to health partners uh, for their ongoing support. So please join me in thanking the speakers.